have not uh, looked into the details and as dr sonawala has kind of rightly pointed out we also learn when we teach that's the best way to learn and understand so uh, we all know that uh, uh, whenever we are treating diabetes blood pressure as well as lipids now we are becoming more aggressive and in all three fronts which are very important to reduce the cardiovascular events uh, we uh, our targets and goals are improving or they are going lower and lower now this is because we have more better uh, drugs and uh, more uh, safer therapies so my presentation starts with a young patient which is a very common scenario currently 37 year old who is already diabetic and type 2 diabetes hypertensive he is a smoker non alcoholic and dyslipidemia taking medications father had a cabg 20 years back and now he is eating outside two to three times a week when we see clinically his bp is 140 80 his bmi is 26 weight is 75 kg now his hemoglobin is 11 what we see is ldl is 168 triglyceride of 210 a low hdl with a uh, creatine of 1.2 hba1c of 8 now his uh, ambulatory bp showed a morning surge of systolic blood pressure troponin was negative and his uh, sugar was 190 B blood ph electrolytes all is normal now this patient is already on tell me certain plus hydrochlorothiazide amlodipine 5 mg of proto rosuvastatin as a standard anti diabetic therapy of metformin and empagliprazolin and what we see now the ecg shows st elevation in the inferior lead and so probably is a case of inferior olmi is diabetic dyslipidemic as well as he has a sympathetic surge which is seen by an early morning surge in the bp so what we do uh, how do we assess these patients when they have an st elevation mi or acute coronary syndrome it's an uh, every minute to minute uh, evaluation which includes development of hypotension hypertension the fluctuation in the heart rate they can suddenly go into heart blocks we uh, need to find uh, any this is a failure pulmonary edema because the inferior mi is a small mi pulmonary edema is uncommon but if they develop a mitral papillary muscle dysfunction then they can go into pulmonary edema any other extra vascular abnormality, JVP, whenever with inferior MI, we have a right ventricular infarction, the ventricular, uh, what we call is jugular venous uh, distension is seen. Any cardiogenic shock, uh, as well as the heart sound or a new murmur. New murmur in such setting is a very big alarm of either a ventricular septal rupture or an acute mitral regurgitation, which will push into patient into the uh, shock. And we need to prepare with an intrahepatic balloon pump and uh, ventilator for such uh, if you uh, hear some uh, murmur in these patients now uh, what we do is you ch check whether there are q waves coming or the settling of stt segment check by biomarker every four to six hours now uh, how you manage this patient this is st uh, elevation mi or you can say non st mi if the uh, st settles and it uh, at its own without a q wave immediately sometime so that becomes a non st mi but definitely this piece will come under the uh, acute coronary syndrome and as per guidelines these patients require a uh, supportive treatment apart from that pharmacological intervention beta blocker dual antiplatelet and anticoagulant high dose statin and they may require invasive coronary revascularization and in long term we want this patient should not have similar episodes and then we have uh, what we call is a secondary prevention and which itself is an uh, which lifestyle support or cardiac rehab and you have dual antiplatelet statins and uh, other drugs. Now, this patient when undergone coronary angiogram, underwent a PCI to LED, and uh, there was a OM occlusion which was thought to be continuous on medical management. So, this patient undergoes an angioplasty. Now, his pre existing medication is 5 milligram of rosuvastatin. With that, his LDL is 168. We all know that these patients require more aggressive therapy. And if you have an uh, aggressive reduction of LDL, which is less than uh, uh, 70 milligram, we do find almost 12% reduction in major cardiovascular events. So uh, if you give statins uh, in high doses, what we see is there is a uh, uh, um, plaque stability yeah, or what we say is uh, as the LDL goes down, uh, as the LDL goes down, there is a reduction change in the percentage of necrotic core. Necrotic core means the lipid deposit uh, which is um, there goes down and uh, what we see is change in the inflammatory marker like crp so with this high dose statin now uh, both uh, the common message both the guidelines whether you speak of esc or acc 
they say that you have an ldl is a very primary target and uh, it's a proven pharmacotherapy uh, is there and they emphasize that there should be 50% reduction in the ldl for example if a starting patient's ldl is 100 or 110 then you want it to come to 50 so this definition uh, uh, is a new introduction initially we had a hard targets of 100 110 now and we always had question in our mind that if patient starting ldl itself is 100 then what to do now the guidelines both acc ac are very clear if you start whatever is your starting you want it to reduce it to 50 and then we have definitely number goals also they they also remains that in high risk patient we should have so and so ldl moderate and low risk what is the ldl uh, is required now this ldl remains uh, sub optimal despite the maximum dolorator statin and then we have a concept of uh, what we call is non statin they, they are restricted to high risk adult like ezetimib and uh, fibrates as well as psk9 inhibitors these remains the second line treatment statin do remain the first line treatment now when we address uh, if uh, there is a primary prevention then we calculate their uh, risk score and the most popular is a hscvd risk score from acc and aha the european people do have an uh, different scoring system which is a score uh, score and it is a systemic coronary risk evaluation now based on this scoring system one can divide the patients into the different risk category and then both guidelines have given different goals or the targets so apart from uh, what we say is 50% reduction for secondary prevention what is secondary prevention those people who have already developed an event like our patient has already an event and his ldl is 168 so what we want we want is ldl less than 55 so more than 50% from the baseline and less than 55 For example, if his starting is 100, then maybe we or starting if it is 80, then we want less than 55, but 40 would be a better target. So you have to have both conditions. I, you have to reduce more than 50%, but it has to go below 55 in very high risk. Now, very high risk patients are those who have already developed an atherosclerotic event, whether it is stroke, whether it is peripheral vascular disease, or an acute coronary syndrome. Now, if you have A patient who have ASCVD and then you develop an another vascular event within two, uh, about two years, it may be some different event, but atherosclerotic event, and then we want this 55, we want it to come to 40. So please understand those who have recurrent. So means they have bigger problem, second vascular event. Sometimes we do have patients developing an enteral MI and then coming for a PCI for a right coronary artery after uh, one to two year, and they are already on good pharmacotherapy. here that means they are more uh, problematic patients and you because they want their ldl further lower than 55 now those patients uh, who are high risk from very high risk we are coming to so first was very high risk second is the recurrent events and now we have high risk moderate risk and low risk from high risk we have 70 goal moderate risk we have go goal less than 100 and if it's an uh, low risk then goal is 116 so whenever these patients uh, are uh, the first thing what we do uh, for these uh, patients is you go on high intensity statin on highest the tolerated goal and then you reassess whether you have reached goal or not and then you have options of other drug if you are not reaching the goals many of these patient only even if you give high mod uh, intensity statin may not reach on the goal because as i started our all goals whether it is hba1c ldl or it is the blood pressure we are now talking lower the better but there is a different between all these three things in diabetes you have risk of hypoglycemia in hypertension you have dizziness giddiness and hypertension in dyslipidemia we don't know what is the lower if patients are you know there is no obvious uh, you know problem is going till you know 15 and to even 20 uh, mg deciliter so that is a uh, you know the more uh, less risk therapy if you go aggressive in diabetes we have uh, seen increase in the mortality when you are trying to push them to hba1c of 6.5 and similarly in multiple hypertensive trial you have seen more renal event and stroke when we are combining uh, multiple uh, anti hypertensive but however he, this is a different territory where the benefit is uh, definite there but then the risk of uh, low is uh, uh, almost uh, negligible now this is the esc guideline algorithm which says from very high risk to high risk to moderate and low risk your ldl goals goes from 55 to 70 and 100 to 160 and these are the definitions where you have a score uh, uh, less than 1% then you are low risk 
one to five percent, you have moderate risk. So this is the young people who are diabetic less than fifty. Usually, all diabetic patients, there is nothing. Once a patient develops diabetes, they do not. There is nothing like low risk. All diabetic, they will form in a moderate risk. And diabetic with some end organ damage would come into a moderate risk. And those who have clinical events and advanced CKD with diabetes with target organ, they will become a high risk. So when a person is high risk, either they have clinical events or they have clinical or imaging showing an atherosclerotic occlusion of the major blood vessels. So that is your CV risk goes high and high, and your goes low and low with the increasing risk. So back when we come to our patient, our patient form into very high CV risk, and uh, his target allele is less than 55. So uh, this is the uh, uh, strength of the recommendation uh, by the uh, ESC guideline that all acute coronary syndrome when there is a contraindication, when though no contraindication, definite in, uh, or intolerant, they are not intolerant, then we are recommending to initiate a high dose statin as early as possible, whatever is the initial LDL values. Because many a time people do ask, patient do ask, sir, you started on cholesterol pill, I have a heart attack, but my cholesterol which I have done was normal. So we have to tell them, Yes, please understand whatever is your cholesterol, if you are developing blockages, that is high for your body. That is what we tell our patients. So this is a class 1A recommendation because it is a strong recommendation based on multiple randomized clinical trials. So you need to start irrespective of your initial LDL values. Then you re-evaluate at 4 to 6 weeks and check whether it is 50% reduction from the baseline or you should reach the target which is less than 55 Definitely safety issues are to be taken at the time of starting doses and we have to change accordingly. This is a class 2 A recommendation, which is which means it should be done. Now, if you don't achieve the LDL goal at the 4 to 6 weeks with maximum tolerated tassin, then you are adding ezetimibe. It's a very safe drug, no major side effects. It acts on your gut lumen and interfere with LDL reabsorption. So, when we speak of diabetic dyslipidemia, I think Viraj Kapoor will throw more light on this. But again, moment you are diabetic, you are you never uh, are low risk. Uh, uh, a low risk diabetes is a moderate cardiovascular risk. And if they have high risk, your LDL goals we have already discussed. And many of the diabetic may require a combination therapy, which I think will come in the third lecture, which is about diabetic dyslipidemia. What about hypertriglyceridemia? In 2016 to 2019, you say that you are considering statin for high risk of uh, hypertriglyceridemia. So even if patient the triglyceride is say 200, it's only the statin, statin and statin because statin is going to bring down your uh, triglycerides uh, to less than uh, or reduction by 30 to 40 percent. So many prescription ISO, you know, in India, we have fixed dose combination of fibrate and statin. Usually, even if LDL is little high, majority of these patients with acute coronary syndrome they would not require an additional or what you call second line therapy. So what is high and moderate and low dose intensity statin therapy? You all know if you want a more than 50% reduction, then you require a high dose statin and that is what is the goal in all acute coronary syndrome patients. So we have 40 80 mg of atorvastatin and 20 and 40 mg of rosuvastatin. That is what is a definition of high dose statin or high intensity statin. Then when, when we speak of high intensity, we have two choice between atorvastatin and rosuvastatin. So we have some important uh, trials. As I told, though all the data is old, but guidelines are new and some of the old trials, which we have probably overlooked sometime, they are in a literature, but they uh, are always interesting. So how does uh, an aggressive statin therapy help patients with atherosclerotic plaque and lipid content? So this is a study by uh, yellow study which stands for results from reduction in yellow plaque by aggressive lipid lowering trial and this was published in 2017 so this is very interesting study but it's a small study of 85 to 100 patients and uh, the the basis of study is a mechanistic study we all know that we have large randomized control trial that has shown the beneficial effect of statin both in primary prevention as well as secondary prevention and uh, all several uh, iva studies they do have shown a regression of a plaque when you use uh, a statin therapy. Now, whether you statin modulate the plaque by changing composition or flow and uh, these uh, uh, mechanisms are not that much understood. So you have these patients 
a small population of 87 with double triple uh, double vessel or uh, triple vessel disease they are undergoing uh, uh, angioplasty and they are uh, undergoing multiple uh, uh, what you say diagnostic modalities like ffr to check blood flow intravascular ultrasound and spectroscopy so the spectro i was is uh, by which we are knowing the uh, lipid content uh, and even oct is done so basically we are imaging the plaques here and we are doing spectroscopy spectroscopy is to check about the inflammation in the plaque so you check this inflammation put them on high dose aggressive statin which is 40 mg uh, statin with dual antiplatelet and at the end of year you ch check these standard patients versus aggressive so what happens to this patients with high dose you do a follow up i was ffr oct or nrs you repeat them and then uh, mm, definitely depending on their ffr you can uh, do an angioplasty or treat them medically depending on how is the blood flow and this this data is analyzed and we are trying to understand what happened to the lipid core and what we see that there is a 20% 22 in a period of one year which is according to me is not very long because atherosclerosis is a very long disease it's a you know disease with a incubation period of a decade and you know proliferative phase and then uh, you have a problem so in this if you are getting one year almost 22% reduction in lipid core burden index so means the uh, whatever plaque so you do an angioplasty of a 90% lesion but there are multiple plaques in the coronary tree and what you happens to this is almost 20 so this is what is a standard and versus aggressive lipid lowering and what we see is a 20% reduction is lipid core burden index which means the yellow or what we call is lipid core is come down now when we speak uh, speak of different statin you are rosuvastatin 40 mg as reduction in ldl which is definitely much more as compared to the other drugs and this was seen in an lunar study of atorvastatin versus uh, rosuvastatin in high doses and increase in ldl is much more in rosuvastatin and which is less even with the highest dose of um, atorvastatin so even 10 mg if you give you find a reduction in a triglyceride of 25% and that is what guideline says even if there is a triglyceride which is 200 200 200 300 don't jump on fibrate just bank on statin statin and only high dose statin so once uh, uh, these uh, patients require high dose statin and uh, um, what uh, do do and do an angioplasty do they need to continue these therapies or high dose statin because yes because it is not only the even if you have uh, treated the initial culprit lesion there are insignificant plaques which are there and this is very interesting study called prospect study which studies almost angioplasty patient does their ivers and see that what happens the culprit lesion where i have put stent is doing well but non culprit lesion and in other sites they come up within the period of 3 years so as patients goes from uh, away from the pci you see that there are 20% events and significant event uh, again come from what we call is non culprit lesion so the lesions which were very small 50% 30% they can turn into culprit lesion and they are one which would require a good medical therapy and high dose statin is shown to regress the atherosclerosis so one of the study where it shows that high dose rosuvastatin it is reducing the carotid intimal medial thickness over a period of 1 to 2 years so you have a mortality benefit in those who are statin adherent so this is a very interesting paper from Mm, journal of american heart association post acute coronary syndrome and these are the event rates so these are the three kaplan meier curve the green one says those who are adherent so the, your survival probability is more if you remain adherent it becomes moderately and uh, uh, non adherent your uh, you, uh, survival probability goes down and if you are severely non adherent your probability will be much more so 12 month survival probability is more in those who are he is started on therapy and they are adherent and here is a very important role of a general practitioner because majority of acute coronary syndrome they have one follow up with us and then they go to the general practitioner and keeping them adherent to statin uh, is an important uh, thing now how we can assure the efficiency and outcome i finally close remark about the generic versus the innovator so this was an important uh, one of the study uh, which shows that uh, you uh, the drug absorption pattern of an uh, uh, generic uh, versus uh, would be uh, not good 
and uh, one of the study from uh, spain which shows that with generic statin you have increased incidence or increased event as compared to the research brand and what happens is that the uh, there is some minor differences in the uh, purity of the uh, drug if you have impure drug the stability of rosuvastatin and shelf life is affected and though you have manufactured or a good or a normal statin but once the uh, shelf life is uh, impaired and the efficiency of the drug may go down so when we comes back to the case that this patient definitely require a very aggressive reduction in ldl because we want to stabilize regress the plaque and re reduce the events he should be adherent as per luna trial in acute coronary syndrome you would get 40 mg uh, 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 rosuvastatin more ldl reduction as compared to atorvastatin and this current patient which ldl was almost 160 the target of 155 I think after four to six weeks, we will have to add ezetimibine because even if you give forty mg rosuvastatin, you can now you may not reach this target. You may get fifty percent reduction in LDL, but if you want a fifty-five, specifically is a diabetic and a young patient, and this goal would be difficult unless you add another drug. But then you need to wait according to guidelines for three to four weeks and reassess a lipid profile. Then um, definitely vulnerability of a plaque is uh, uh, what leads to the acute uh, event. and that is how statins are working and this was uh, we have shown you a mechanistic study uh, based on intravascular ultrasound and oct where the atherosclerosis regression occurs the lipid core uh, reduces as well as the thickness of the cap and even when we do spectroscopy we see left uh, macrophage invasion left infection in the plaque after the high dose when we compare with the low dose of the statin so rosuvastatin is one of the statin which has shown in multiple intracoronary imaging you are sh slowing down atherosclerosis progression and this atherosclerosis progression definitely goes with the ldl level your ldl goes less than 50 then only we do see this type of uh, regression so in yellow study there is an impact on plaque morphology and there is an imp improvement in plaque stability with reduced uh, plaque size which is called as plaque regression so to give optimal efficiency we should consider a good quality statin so we have Uh, in summary lunar trial which shows that in initial 3 months of acs you have superior ldl reduction and this is translated by an i current uh, study of jacc where uh, you have plaque regression and reduction in the lipid core index and beyond one year we have a uh, mutor study which it shows that there is a continuous regression in the carotid intermal thickness so this is how uh, the drug is acting on multiple uh, you know, time in the, uh, and uh, Uh, different uh, vascular beds with that i thank you all for your patience listening thank you very much dr pravin there is a question in the uh, chat box that uh, should you worry about the ldl fraction and uh, not, not to worry and look for small dense lipoproteins rather than the entire gamut of ldls Yes. See, what happens is uh, there are something which we know, and something probably we may not know. So we are uh, aware that you know the especially diabetic dyslipidemia and all they do have uh, uh, you know the so we are treating two things. One is the quantity of LDL, and another is the quality of LDL. So definitely we know that uh, diabetic do have different quality of LDL. They are small dense particle. and if you target this particle number that would be good idea but i think that is not practical uh, currently what we have uh, in day to day practice is the only the quantity of ldl rather than measuring the particles their sizes that would be uh, probably more in a uh, research and uh, according to you how low you can go is there any time where you have to stop your statin therapy Uh, i think i started uh, my presentation by discussing yeah. that how lipid diabetes and uh, the here, here the safety till for 15 20 i think there is a established safety with new psk9 inhibitor and we go by ldl of you know chimpanzees and ldl of newborn which is 20 30 so i don't think that till 20 uh, 20 to 30 you need to uh, cut, uh, you know reduce your uh, doses especially if the patient is high risk Thank you, thank you very much. Now I think we'll start with the second talk, and to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Nilesh Gautam, I'll invite 
Bhavna Patel, who is our chairman for the IMA Academy of Medical Specialties. Bhavna Patel, Madam, please introduce Dr. Nilesh Goyal. Are Nilesh Gautam? Thank you, uh, Dr. Akil. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a pleasant duty to introduce Dr. Nilesh Gautam, whom I know right from his childhood. He is a, a, a cardiologist, interventional cardiologist, having vast experience of 20 years. He has uh, extensive experience in non-invasive investigational and interventional procedures. He has performed more than 500 angiographies and more than 1,000 angioplasties. He has worked as a primary investigator in international clinical trials on the newer drugs in the treatment of hypertension and many other cardiac diseases. He also has uh, uh, done clinical trials in the newer stenting techniques and the treatment modalities of the coronary heart disease. He has to his credit many, many presentations and many publications at the national and international journal. I have got a big list, you know, which I cannot enumerate. So here I welcome Dr. Nilesh Gautam, who is going to talk to us today on acute coronary syndrome. Over to you, Dr. Nilesh. Uh Thank you. Thank you for those uh, kind words. Well, uh, as a doctor, as a co-host, as a coordinator, as a family, <laughs> as someone you correctly said, I have looked up to since my childhood days. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the introduction. And I would thank IMA for having given me this opportunity to speak to all of you and AstraZeneca. All... Uh, just I would like to take a minute uh, out of the leaf of the my my good friend Dr. Praveen and the question which was by one of the people, one of the um, uh, doctors. Well, LDL theoretically is divided into four particles, large, moderate, that is intermediate, small. Again, like very correctly he mentioned, it is much of theory rather than going into uh, practic uh, practicality. Um, but L lower the better, as we say. And yes, uh, question put forward very rightly because smaller the LDL particle, more denser it is and hence enhanced atherogenicity of that molecule. So yes, if we have uh, in um, uh, a particular way, if we can target uh, a drug in future and clinical trials are going on, which will target the small density LDL particles, then yes, uh, that may be a way forward. So coming back to our, uh, I, because lipids are close to my heart and I, I do try to read and keep myself abreast of what, and the question put forward, I think has been uh, a very valid one from um, somebody who is academically up to date and oriented. That's the other advantage of in IMA because the questions which come up uh, do show that uh, yes, uh, the doctors who are attending are um, very academically inclined. Well, coming back to uh, ACS management during pandemic period, we are all going through this, uh, phases are coming, waves are coming, new variants are coming. Well, we are learning and, uh, and hopefully clinical guidelines uh, which have been set forward and certain things which we have been doing um, in, in this uh, period, I will be talking to you personally what I have done uh, and uh, I have been a part of uh, the core committee of Cardiology Society of India and formulating the guidelines because um, very one I, I was one of the very few uh, cardiologists who continued to do primary angioplasty right from day one even in this uh, in COVID patients also, um, with God's grace, till now at least fully vaccinated and I have not had COVID. Uh, so something may, and I'm lucky, of course. So what are those things which I think uh, should be followed is what I'm going to talk to you. The next slide, the first slide, please. The pathophysiology, what is the mechanism of COVID-19 in relation to the cardiovascular system? the protective measures for health and practices in cardiology, what we should do, 
in the cath lab what we should do in the emergency room what we should do in our um, uh, in our clinical practice when we see patients the protocols for acs management during covid antiplatelet prescription uh, in acs during the outbreak these are the topics uh, the headings under which i would be speaking uh, to all of you mm. so what what really does uh, happen as far as uh, um covid 19 is concerned well uh, it's primarily a respiratory disease but here we are talking about a lot of complication vascular occurring why does this basically occur we all know there is a multiplication of the virus inflammation there is a cytokine storm but enhanced thrombogenicity now if any uh, fever respiratory illness it is bound to increase the metabolic load in the body so the heart has to work more so if it is a uh, ischemic heart or if the ischemic burden is low uh, is moderate to high in uh, mild or moderate blockages if there is persistent tachycardia for hours or days together well the ischemia gets precipitated hence increase events if it is already a tired heart a failing heart and um, again the work load is more uh, there is vasoconstriction continuous tachycardia cytokines being released inflammatory inflammation endothelial dysfunction so all this enhanced thrombogenicity so all this precipitates heart failure uh, so cv disease also may be a primary phenomenon right because it has some amount of pathophysiological role in the renin angiotensin ace uh, uh, ace um, axis and that is what uh, all these together um, various pathophysiologies lead to increase uh, microvascular plugging clot formation and event rate in the form of stroke in the form of acute myocardial infarctions peripheral embolization peripheral vascular disease uh renal arterial thrombosis and so on and so forth next slide please so again uh yeah about the protective measures the next slide yes so what exactly uh, happens is that um we we are very well aware and we have three categories of patients uh one is definitely coming in for an elective procedure which we are not going to talk about in this uh, scenario uh he has a covid negative uh, rt pcr negative report hrct is normal he goes in for a procedure as as a normal patient now a patient has come in walk in as an acute myocardial infarction we do not know his covid status we have to treat him as a covid positive patient what we do is yes <clears throat> the door to balloon time starts immediately as the patient comes in first medical contact in the hospital and now within 60 minutes your artery should be opened is what uh, the guidelines recommend he immediately of course shaving preparation is done he is loaded with uh, medicines what are required according to the guidelines a rapid antigen test for covid is done he is wheeled in immediately into um the radiology department right the besides just next to the emergency department is the radiology department um the the, the specific ct machine is there only for suspect or covid positive patients ct is done we by now we have uh, with these two the rapid antigen and the hrct we are 80 to 90% sure whether he may have covid or is not covid rat is negative with a negative hrct we are definitely sure well these patients can be in early failure and the corad uh, score uh, on the ct may be blind we still don't know with a negative uh, rapid antigen right we are still careful what are we supposed to do from the first medical point in contact complete pp kit um has to ensure the patient goes in through a green cor uh, corridor means from the er directly into the hrct from there uh, through the separate uh, corridor into uh, the lift and goes into the cath lab so often personnel who are going to come in touch with this patient need to be in pp kits 
once he is in the cath lab yes academically uh, up to date and uh, oriented that's the other advantage of taking you through in uh, ima because the uh, questions which come up but, uh, do but show that that uh, yes uh, the doctors who are attending are is a confirmed um, case very academically so inclined probability or negative well, negative of course is elective we don't talk about that so level of protection again no holiday there is no sunday as far as covid is concerned so you have to have a complete kit um and not only it's it's very important not only you but uh, the staff uh, because usually everybody the staffs work in three shifts so all the staff the ward boys they are trained if there is a new staff on board he or she has to be trained about thing donning means putting it on and doffing is removal of the ppe kit most of the infections occur during doffing that is removal of the ppe in an improper manner which causes because because on the external surface there the virus may still be there while removing it while removing your kit if you accidentally touch the surface well you are you are going to carry uh, carry the virus uh, on on your hands or the part where you've touched and next is you go and touch face nose and that's that's the point of uh, entry so yes all um, a, a lot of debate about which uh, uh, uh mask to be worn whether two masks are required well what is required is an n mask a single one right uh preferably if you can use and throw it after 8 hours of continuous wearing right if we go in and operate on a um, a patient whose covid status is not known right then after the case the uh, entire kit along with uh, the mask is um disposed of into the red bag of course uh, repeated uh, hand washing complete is is again a must two things again um, as we speak about the precautions which need to be taken and what i personally have followed no scientific data here but uh, this is a forum where which is very close to me and we are we are all uh, treating patients two things which i have followed from day one is one is uh, what we call it yes as you can go ahead and see on youtube nahi mera ho gaya bilkul three seconds so dusra you that that is done and second is um betadine uh, ointment if you can apply it on the inner ela of your nose then at least 6 to 8 hour protection definitely uh, is there i can say it from practical experience at least covid Okay. it's a protective measures for healthcare personnel in the cath lab to be versed in proper techniques of donning and doffing especially the eyewear um at no time to wait for because patient is unstable has acute myocardial infarction i did tell you he goes in straight through the green corridor into the cath lab if he is a non stemi um, acs patient again unstable he goes into the cath lab if he is a stable patient oh, yeah. we try and stabilize him right we wait uh, as soon as he is in suspect icu area if there is a covid negative suspect and a covid positive icu so these patients whose reports are not there are in the covid their nasopharyngeal swab when we get two negative results of course the rat is done as soon as he comes in with a negative uh, uh, hrct to the cath lab the next slide please right so in in a positive patient when an invasive approach is indicated um one we should have a dedicated cath lab again not possible because of, because of the huge cost incurred so to have two cath labs uh, one for a covid positive or a suspect patient and a negative patient well it's a dream come true but um, again due to economic uh, constraint not possible um what what is done usually is that once uh, the case is done the cath lab is completely sealed and sterilized chemicals 
and done for two hours. Then uh, complete fogging is done for another two hours. Then the cath lab is uh, opened and uh, air changes about 16 to 18 are done. And then the next case goes in. Right. This is what uh, is the protocol uh, followed. These patients again are unstable. They are in respiratory distress. A number of them uh, acute myocardial infarction, inferior wall MIs due to diaphragmatic uh, bradycardia, blood pressure fluctuation, hypotension, and a large number of them even uh, vomit on table. So this all increase aerosol load. Um, in the cath lab and on the personnel who are uh, working there. So most of the cath labs uh, are not designed and for negative uh, pressure. That means uh, you the air is out from there and thrown out and the fresh air comes in. What normally happens is positive ventilation. The air condition is blowing air inside to reap displace the air which is already there. So if negative suction uh, can be uh, employed in uh, deployed in the cath lab in such patients, again, uh, it will definitely be of use. The next slide, please. Right, so algorithm for triage of patients admitted to the emergency room. This is already something which I did speak to you. If symptoms are there, uh, COVID infection may be possible. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, non-cardiac, uh, asymptomatic, he is sent home for quarantine. If he is unstable, uh, non-cardiac, again, he goes in um, to the suspect, uh, to the COVID positive ICU. Well, if we do not know his COVID status, we send it immediately. If he is a cardiac patient or unstable patient, depending upon whether he needs emergency cath lab uh, or whether he can be monitored, uh, in suspect ICU and we take care uh, and wait for the results and then subject him to PCI. The next slide, please. So this is the algorithm which is in, in all the emergency departments. So they know exactly when uh, to do code red and when uh, the patient needs an emergency cath lab procedure and is sent uh, accordingly. So many institutions in US have placed a moratorium uh, on elective procedure. So the load uh, is so high um, that elective PCIs or elective procedure, again, the patient needs to wait uh, in the scenario again because the um, bed strength available for non-COVID patients in any hospital are low because the hospitals are already flooded with COVID patients. So if the patient is stable, we defer... Um, angiography and angioplasty in these group of patients though i personally do not agree <clears throat> uh, because we do not know if a patient is coming with chest pain and uh, minor ecg changes uh, we put him on aggressive medical management send him home what is the un what is the uh, of him having an unstable plaque which ruptures in the night and he has an acute myocardial infarction and has uh, um, ultimate event that is mortality happening due to um, ventricular arrhythmia before he reaches the hospital. So, which of these patients? Yes, uh, we talk about. We are, I am talking about a specific subset of coronary arterial disease patients. If you have uh, congenital heart disease patients or uh, peripheral vascular or those requiring, um, say, devices, yes, they definitely can wait. But as far as ischemic heart disease is concerned, which stable patient is going to become unstable at the time, we do not know. And um, if investigated with uh, proper uh, precautions, uh, we can definitely go ahead and take them. Right? Um, so in, in a patient with known COVID and STEMI, well, um, in a Initially, also, there was, uh, there was fear uh, about COVID uh, and that how infectious uh, it is and what will be the overall uh, outcome and what will uh, the infectivity rate be and transmission rate uh, be uh, in 
if if a, if a procedure is performed in a positive patient and the risk faced um, for the cardiac uh, for the cardiologist means the doctors and the staff and the personnel but yes now we have enough data and we know uh, over a period of time through trial and error and uh, temporary negative suction pumps being applied so they suck out uh, the air and it's thrown out into the atmosphere directly with all all these things uh, coming into play uh, certain changes being made uh, in the cath lab uh, we can go ahead and and safely perform uh, procedures in these patients with uh, negligible risk uh, for transmission uh, to the medical personnel the next slide please right so if you have uh, definitely on reperfusion strategy what i have spoken if the patient is in a pci enabled hospital go ahead and do an angioplasty if he is not yes then it's drip and ship thrombolize the patient and as early as possible shift him to a pci enabled lab um the next slide please i would like to um, tell you here uh, that uh, again um, initial phases of covid when when we were doing angioplasty um and the management of uh, covid itself was coming up um, the culprit vessel go ahead and do an angioplasty the patient is doing fine then uh, i mean this was he has become fever covid positive and Uh, he 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 has an acute myocardial infarction go ahead and do a angioplasty fourth fifth sixth day he goes storm he develops a stroke or he develops again a myocardial infarction if you've done an led plasty he'll develop in uh, right coronary artery and that at that point in time it got us to think that this is a pro thrombotic state and a lot of uh, debate and hence the guidelines came out that even if a patient of acute myocardial infarction uh, is having um, is is having covid uh, go ahead and thrombolize him do not do an intervention well then we had better drugs we had uh, at the, this i'm talking in the initial phase when we were using chloroquine and we were not using steroids and so as more and more knowledge came out and and we were more and more confident um again we these angioplasties in covid positive patients because having said that even if it is a pro thrombotic state if there is a clot in the lad if you are going to leave it saying to a cytokine storm four or five days later and maybe develop a reinfarct in that area or in the right coronary artery or another place uh five to seven days is enough time left ventricular ejection fraction to go down from 50 or 60 to 20 and and you've lost the game so even if he comes out of uh, covid he's he's going to be a heart failure patient number days the next slide please right so again uh, we learned in our hospital um patients would be stopped at the door gates of the hospital you have to screen them before you enter so again a protocol was developed that yes any pay, all these protocols were developed in order to help um the patient uh the patient coming into a hospital right and spreading covid to all of uh, the other uh, people in the hospital including the medical personnel and the uh, other patients but um, so we we sort of had to train even the uh, the security officials that if uh, the first he's come and he complains of chest pain uh, the patient who's in the ambulance or in his car or if he's an ambulance and we have a e- ecg or an ekg immediately it's whatsapp uh, to the security guard and he transmits that uh, whatsapp the ecg immediately to the er doctor and if it is an acute coronary syndrome well then um, green corridor starts and at that point we consider the security guard as the first medical point of contact so once that is bell is alerted every 
already in the hospital code STEMI is announced. So within 60 minutes, then it's monitored that he is on table. The cardiologist has performed the angioplasty. The artery is open. So, so, so yes, it's a, it's a unprecedented thing. First time we are seeing, we all are in the learning phase. And as time evolves, more and more data come right um, to practically at each stage try and do away with uh, the delays so that optimal medical care can be offered. Right, please. Right, the antiplatelet prescription, the next slide. So what I have tried to do, you'll see the slides do mention things and, and um, um, I've given you time to read and I'm telling you things which practically I have seen in the last two, two years and on, on ground uh, what problems we have faced and how we have overcome. There is so much of information which is available uh, today and so much things which I, I want to tell you from my practical experience is what, what I'm trying uh, to do here. Uh, so there is excessive inflammatory response. We know it and that is how uh, these complications are occurring. So initially it was if, if your patient of acute myocardial infarction has come, you're taking him up for a primary angioplasty. He is a COVID positive patient. Uh, we should not give blood thinners. Uh, don't give it in high dosages. Then low molecular weight heparins were given in double the dosages. IV heparin for 48 hours was given. And this is how uh, every week we evolved sort of in the treatment till, till week. And, uh, and quite a number of times gut feeling, instinctive feeling um, without really waiting for the guidelines. We went ahead and sort of evolved protocols. Uh, till more and more uh, data came up. The next slide, please. So it is a prothrombotic state. Even if there are no plaques, yes, there is increased enhanced uh, uh, incidence of a stroke, any vascular event in the form of stroke, MI or in the peripheries. The next slide, this is what uh, it shows. So not only uh, even if you go ahead and do an angioplasty in the vessel, Again, the stent can get thrombosed. In another vessel, it can get thrombosed. And the incidence is very high. So this is what we were finding out initially. This, this data came out later on. But you, you can see and has been published in the Journal of, uh, of American College of the Jack in September 2020. Now, we have been talking about and we saw these cases in February, March, April, May um, in our cath labs. And, and by May, we were sort of uh, coming on the back foot that should we go ahead and do angioplasty in these patients. They are spending about two and a half to three lakh rupees and within 48 hours coming back, 72 hours coming back with a reinfarction, maybe in other territory or the same territory, stent getting thrombos, you, you, you need to then just suck out the thrombus, give intracoronary GP2B3A and wait and watch. So should we go ahead and do, are we doing more damage or more benefit? So all these questions were in our minds and as data evolved, um, we became wiser. The next slide, please. Right. So the next slide, please. So we need the dual line, so-called again, prasugrel. Uh, I, I always say it's a molecule of the past. I do not like to use clopidogrel or for that matter uh, prasugrel now. The next slide, please. It is equally effective maybe uh, to ticagrel or uh, but uh, increase incidence of uh, bleeding. Yes, definitely more potent and better uh, than clopidogrel. But again, uh, if you have to use it in the periphery or in, my, in a clinic before sending him to a tertiary care center, you may want to load with clopidogrel because we are going to load him up with uh, prasu uh, with uh, ticagrel or any which ways we take him uh, to the lab. So if you can load straight with uh, ticagrel or nothing like it. Next slide, please. So what we have been hammered in 100 milligrams of clopidogrel has to be loaded and in an acute MI or ACS uh, non stemi situation and then he has to be sent to a uh, PCI enabled uh, hospital, a tertiary care hospital. Now, if you can load him, crush, uh, crush again, why I say because uh, practical experience, I said a lot of these patients vomit. We give them anti-emetics and we give them before we take them up to the lab. But uh, a lot of pain, 
sometimes reaction to the drugs hypotension diaphragmatic irritation causes vomiting so if you have not crushed uh, the anti platelet and given the whole tablet comes out and um, platelet inhibition is not there next dose of platelet would come 12 hours later so from a pro thrombotic state he is he has been loaded he vomits uh there is no anti platelet inhibition a stent has been put 12 hours later he gets his first dose no loading dose of an anti platelet so it's very very important uh i i make this you need to crush your anti platelet on the first point of contact and give it to him because some amount of oral absorption would have occurred directly into the blood stream the next slide please um prasugrel's efficacy over clopidogrel uh, we don't talk about uh, history um again what next the next slide please we need to have a drug which will have rapid onset of action so there we have ticagrel or uh, how it has we were using iv gp 2b 3a blockers uh, abcisimumab and um, things like that so but if you are going to the interventionist before the patient uh, means when i do a, a shoot first shoot on the angiogram if there is half an hour 45 minutes uh, interval uh, adequate platelet inhibition has occurred and what we see is uh, thrombus uh, and with uh, plaque rupture and various techniques available to us we are able to remove the thrombus through thrombus aspiration and we get a clear uh, flow no flow ro- reef no reflow thrombus getting stuck patient uh, having hemodynamic instability on table much much less because it's a reversible direct acting p2 white well inhibitor rapid onset of action higher level of platelet inhibition this this in no way says do not give aspirin as followed by ticagrel or loading and as has been shown again in clinical uh, trials that absolute and relative risk reduction again these are going to be low the next slide please right again if the molecule is more potent more powerful uh, this is bound to happen that the incidence of thrombosis in the real world scenario non covid it uh, reduced by significant that is 33% over the standard therapy which was being given the next slide please right and how we know here we have an efficacious drug more efficacious than the standard therapy which was uh, we were following and the side effects are almost similar or even lesser uh, as compared to the standard therapy so these are the stand out features the next slide right the, uh, again uh, we we just spoken the morbidity mortality benefits are there for all to see the next slide right so the ticagrelor benefit would be maintained throughout the year the answer to the question that, uh, well how long do we continue dual antiplatelets after um, we have uh, given um, to the patient or after the index uh, event has occurred it needs to be continued for a year at least beyond a year we would give if uh, three of uh, stent thrombosis multiple stents more than three left main uh, angioplasty has been done um, severe uncontrolled ckd uh, that means enhanced risk of stent thrombosis then ticagrel or 60 mg twice a day can be given for 2 to 3 years uh, like we have enough uh, data on on that so three molecules we compared and and uh, there is uh, data for all to see that ticagrelor scores the next slide this is the molecule not of the future but of the present and the near past so in last one or two years we are harping on this and um, we we should switch over all our patients so barring chronic stable angina patients right uh, i think acute myocardial infarction unstable angina and stemi all uh, need to straight away be put on uh, on ticagrelor now um this is again uh, ticagrelor versus clopidogrel it was compared no surprise 
you can have various subset of patients you can follow them up for various times the next slide and and what uh, the results have all been um, showing uh, that uh, the event rate goes down well this uh, was to show whether it's um, because it's more potent the logic should be that it it will cause more bleeding and intracranial hemorrhages in these group of patients but that was uh, that was thankfully uh, not the case and hence uh, it is a the next slide please the next slide right next we've spoken about this trial the next slide yeah so um, preference for ticagrelor in the current times of pandemic well it's um, we know there is a prothrombotic state here so we need best possible antiplatelet dual antiplatelets yes aspirin the gold standard along with uh, ticagrelor again clopidogrel various uh, responders and that's that's another theory topic in itself so and it's a pre pro drug requires conversion so so the efficacy we do not know um, so this is uh, the better drug ticagrelor has additionally to inhibit cellular adenosine so theoretically if we want to go it not only uh, is uh, the mechanism p2y12 inhibitor but also inhibits the uh, adenosine um, uptakes please right oral antiplatelet drug whether you are going to do an angioplasty when going to do medical management or you are going to thrombolyze it is critical the next slide so what what i am trying to say is that the next slide there are various generic brands of ticagrelor available in the market well what really happens is there are 64 uh, six chiral centers which means 64 possible stereo isomers so 63 ways of going wrong concentration of the molecule the next slide the impurities are more and hence the response is uh, variable right so pharmacological equivalence pharmaceutical equivalence bioequivalence and therapeutic they are all three different next slide so if you have a range right um, of minus 20 to plus 25 will will enhance <coughs> will not give us uh, the proper inhibition and plus 25 will lead to in of bleeding so it's a fine balance next slide and hence uh, the uh, uh, innovator molecule should be used and to corroborate that fact uh, in kerala a study in 2020 was done well uh, we, we we speak we go back from ticagrelor to clopidogrel so various clopidogrel molecule were seen study uh, study and we found out uh, that as compared to the innovator brand uh, there were a large number of impurities and hence uh, overall effect of the drug was not uh, the one which was desired so extrapolating that data into various brands of ticagrelor available today if ever a done i wouldn't be surprised that we get similar kind of results the next slide please hence the importance of using um, the the uh, innovator uh, brand the next slide please yeah next slide <clears throat> right so this is what uh, we have and uh, all the clinical trials have been done with the innovator molecule and hence is recommended and should be used the next slide. i have a few questions well the journey has been very exciting um elderly patient suffered from covid without any comorbidity is how long will you give um, clopidogrel uh, um, will i give clopidogrel him uh, if he is asymptomatic i would wa wouldn't want to do uh, much i would yes continue him, him on aspirin if he is an elderly asymptomatic with coronary artery disease um, well uh, i i would uh, again uh, sort of label him into what i told if he is chronic stable angina i would put him on aspirin and clopidogrel maybe for a year if he is unstable angina non stemi or acute mi acs situation is 
and your question very categorically states that he is asymptomatic so not in one of the three so then uh, if he is in the three i would want to put him on an ticagrelor for a year so if to answer your question specifically aspirin and clopidogrel maybe for a year if he is a high risk patient um, then i would want to put him on aspirin uh, um, along with maybe a, a novac dr gautam there is one question that uh, you have endothelial dysfunction in uh, covid so can l arginine or citrulline be given as a oxide donor uh see so what what these things would do is they are they would reduce the oxidative stress um a lot of um, debate and whether they really actually do help benefit because already we are bombarding them with cocktail mm, i i really wouldn't know and will they really help or prevent sort of coronary or ischemic events we 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 don't know i think um, a physician or an intensivist or a infectious diseases control would be a better person uh to answer that uh, question but as far as coronary events are concerned uh, or prevention of that i don't see any role of uh, uh, these uh, went in covid scenario thank you thank you one last question though not related to acs right how to manage uh, pots postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome orthostatic tachycardia yeah okay again if the Very very common in covid in the post uh, covid a lot of patients are are coming in with this uh, thing uh, problem and i would like to do a 2d echo in this group of patients if uh, i see the ef is normal then i would uh, want to add him on a him the patient on a small dose of beta blocker my blood pressure if blood pressure not permitting i would like to add evabradin monitor them for 4 to 6 weeks usually they come off then we can uh, uh, reduce if is having a predominant lung condition which is not permitting me to use beta blockers and his ef is normal then i would uh, maybe put him on 30 mg twice a day of diltiazem bp permitting uh, and uh, if i want to step up bp not allowing again add evabradin in this group of thank you thank you so now i think we we'll invite our last speaker and to introduce dr dhiraj kapoor invite our director cgp dr rashmi chopra to introduce dr dhiraj kapoor thank you dr kill contractor good evening friends it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker dr dhiraj kapoor sir is a renowned endocrinologist at kokila ben dhirubhai ambani hospital in mumbai He did his MBBS from Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences in Varda. So did his MD, MRCP, and CCST in endocrinology from the United Kingdom. He spent eleven years working in clinical research in the Faculty of Academic Unit of Diabetes in the University of Sheffield, UK. He is currently a reviewer of Diabetes Care. the american journal of diabetes and a full time consultant in the department of endocrinology at kokila ben dhirubhai ambani hospital i now invite dhiraj <laughs> kapoor to begin his very interesting talk about management of diabetic dyslipidemia over to you sir yeah good evening everybody and thank you for that uh, gentle introduction uh You just share the slides with me. Yes, sir. You can share the screen. Dheera, sir, you want me to share the slides? Yes, yes. That way better. Okay. Just give me one second.
So I think in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes, I'm just going to take you through diabetic uh, dyslipidemia, uh, drugs in for diabetes, and then also covering on a little bit about the uh, DPP-4, and then also talking a little bit about the statin. So management of diabetic dyslipidemia in Indian patient, uh, patients, meeting goals and saving lives. Uh, and share this one second. Yeah, so next slide. So what's the risk factors for diabetes in India? And I think this is a very common slide, uh, which you must have all uh, seen and have all presented previously as well. M male person, family history of diabetes, urban residents, abdominal obesity, hypertension, economic status, though we are even seeing now in the low socioeconomic status as well, increases diabetes, obesity, and elderly. So all along, multiple risk factors for diabetes, especially in India. So next slide. And, and why are we more susceptible to diabetes and heart disease? And that's because we have this typical Indian phenotype. We have a higher insulin resistance. We have this greater abdominal adiposity, which is shown as a higher waist circumference. And that which leads to increased susceptibility to diabetes, heart disease. And this characteristic dyslipidemia, which is high triglycerides, low HDL, and high small dense uh, LDL. So all along this typical Indian uh, phenotype where we have a low BMI as compared to, uh, to even to the Western uh, population, but we are more insulin resistant, more, and that's because we have a lot of this visceral adiposity weight around the waist circumference, which leads to this increased susceptibility to diabetes. Next slide. So the Indian phenotype has a lot of challenges. One is there's a greater abdominal uh, adiposity and visceral fat at any given BMI, even at a low BMI, they're more insulin resistant. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. We have a higher waist circumference and a higher waist to hip ratio. We have lower levels of the adipokine and high plasma leptin levels, which increases the concentration, increased concentration of triglycerides. We have a low rate of glucose disposal. We have impaired insulin secretion and increased insulin resistance. And obviously, the Indian gen uh, or the genetic factors. So a lot of these Indian phenotype uh, uh, factors which we have, which gives um, us challenges to manage uh, our uh, diabetic patients. So all these factors contribute to increased susceptibility to type 2 diabetes uh, mellitus and obviously, and therefore the therapy has to be targeted at, at, uh, uh, at these, uh, uh, you know, at these, uh, you know, when, you, when you treat a diabet uh, diabetic patient, you have to make sure that you're targeting uh, these major issues as well. Next slide. So what if you talk about the glycemic target in, uh, in diabetes uh, in, in a patient in India, that's about the Discover study, and if you look at, we want less, ADS talks about less than 7% and AS talks about less than 6.5, but I think less than 7% is reasonable. If you look at the mean HbA1c across the world is about 8.4% globally, and India is 86 So you would say not a big difference, but we are still doing badly and we are not achieving any of our targets, i.e. reaching at least to HbA1c less than 7%. Next slide. Yeah, so there's a need of appropriate treatment for diabetes. So Indian phenotype needs to control two things, so diabetes and dyslipidemia. We talked about the characteristic Indian phenotype and they have a characteristic lipid profile where they have a low HDL, high triglycerides and high interval of, of small dense LDL. So when we talk of choosing an anti-diabetic uh, drug and what are, what are, uh, should their goals, uh, what should there be goals be? And we've now over the last few years, uh, we've come to understand that these have to be individualized. So you can't, you know, you have a standard around 7%, but if you want it lower, especially in younger patients or higher and older patients, so what, what are the things that uh, tell us those factors? So if the risk potentially associated with hypoglycemia and other uh, drug as well effects, then you'd want the HB1C to be less stringent. And obviously if you have a disease duration, so if a shorter duration of diabetes, you probably want the HB1C lesser than 7%. Longer duration, longer standing, you want to, targets to be less stringent. Life expectancy, if you have longer young diabetic, you want the HB1C to be very strictly controlled, even up to 6.5. If an elderly patient, you want the HB1C even recently about 7.5 or 8. If, you have, if your comorbidity is yes, then you want the HB1C to be a little 7.5 or 8. And if you have established vascular complications, you don't want any hypoglycemia, you'd also want to be less stringent about your diabetic management. Patient preferences, if you have a highly motivated patient with excellent self-care capabilities, yes, then 
all the good go less than seven percent but if you if there's someone who's not very who's not very motivated you probably want it more than seven percent and if you have resource and support system especially uh in terms of uh, a diabetic educator educating them so that your information has hypoglycemia someone to look to then yes you might want to go to hb1c less than seven otherwise a less stringent would be reasonable for for your diabetic patient next slide So it has to be uh, individualized. So any role of early intensification, and this slide is also being presented in a lot of our uh, meetings, and we see that earlier and appropriate intervention may improve the patient's chance of reaching the goal. There is, so we typically start off with the monotherapy, then go on to a dual combination, then go on to a triple combination, and then go on to the insulin. So, in, so if, if, if you, so there's a little clinical inertia associated uh, with this, a stepwise approach of therapy. You're waiting for the HB1C to rise, and then you're trying to in, uh, intervene rather than early intervene, early intensification. Yeah, so initiation of a therapeutic intervention with uh, complementary mechanisms of action, and the potential to use less than maximum dose of individual agents to minimize the side effects. And obviously, the, the FDC uh, options have the potential to improve your patient adherence. So certainly, if you intensify early. Uh, and if you give them an early uh, initial combination therapy, you're going to achieve your HbA1c much lower sooner. You're, you're going to avoid this sort of clinical inertia, which is associated with the stepwise therapy. And, uh, and to achieve this, you would probably need uh, you know, uh, drugs which, uh, which would have complementary actions. And that's why the fixed uh, drug combinations obviously have the potential to improve, uh, to uh, you know, also uh, have the advantage to improve patient adherence as well. Next slide. And that's why it's early. So possible reasons for not intensifying the treatment, patient-related factors, this pill burden of multiple pills, this fear that something is near, majorly wrong that may need to take multiple pills. And obviously, most people now talk about cost of therapy. And treatment-related factors, there's a clinical inertia, the wait and watch approach, uh, where you tell patients, yeah, you come back, stick to a little bit of diet, and then he says, no, no, abhi to Diwali aai hai, abhi, abhi mangoes khane, abhi Diwali aai hai. So it keeps going on, okay, when Diwali finishes, then you start uh, your diet, then we'll see. So, and then obviously, you, know, HB, uh, your, uh, you never reach a target, and then you complicate, and then you know, there's high risk of these microvascular complications happening. Up. Also, the other important thing is that if you give them multiple pills, there are high lenses of dropouts. Next, next slide. So, what are the consequences of delayed intervention? Where you have patients with not uh, with HBC, more, more than not more than seven percent not achieving intensification within a year at five point five years there's significant increase in scope, you know, myocardial infarction, stroke, heart failure, and obviously cardiovascular uh, events. So, you know, if you want to reduce these, you know, early intensification, early bringing early bringing down the HB one C, then you can significantly reduce these uh, these uh, these uh, uh, these complications as well. So there's increased risk of myocardial infarction up to sixty seven percent. And with increased risk of stroke up to 51%, height heart failure 64%, and composite uh, cardiovascular events to about 62%. Next, next slide. So this is the effect of bad glycemic uh, legacy, where you wait and wait and watch, and this is driving the risk of your complication. So if you had early intensified, you could see the lower, uh, uh, you know, the, on the graph, the lower line where patients had achieved less than seven percent then obviously these complications could have been prevented. Next slide. So what, if you just briefly about metformin, the old, good old drug that we use, half-life is about five hours. It's not metabolized and excreted unchanged in urine and it, has, it is highly water-soluble. Next slide. When you, and when, so what are the advantages, especially of a fixed drug combination in diabetic management? We talked about patient adherence. The crucial factors for effective management of diabetes includes persistence, patient compliance, and adherence to therapy. And obviously, the FDC, the ease of administration, ease of remembrance, synergistic effect, you know, the complementary effects, and mechanism of action, less side effects because you use low dose, cost containment, and obviously, the most important thing, reduce bail burden and thereby your compliance. So here... We talk of the need of the R obviously is to reduce the number of pills so that patients can reach the HP1C target. And this is we're talking here about one FDC combination, the sex and metformin, and where it's one drug, so patient inconvenience and gives you a 24 hour control with one pill. And obviously, that uh, the compliance is much better. Next slide. 
So it's, you know, and this is the only DPP four and metformin fixed dose combination that is truly once daily. It's available in uh, uh, India with the unique gel matrix uh, shield diffusion uh, technology, and I won't go much into it. But you can say it's release of sexagliptin metformin to improve glycemic control. The sexagliptin outer coat dissolves immediately, exposing the inner coat, and gastric fluid enters the tablet, causing those polymers to swell, and uh, uh, and the, and the metformin then diffuses through the gel and is slowly released. So that's how the, the fixed drug combination of a single of DPP for extended release metformin works. Next slide. So this is the one which has this extended release and the only one which in India which uh, with an extended release FTC. And we know that when you talk of uh, IR immediate release versus extended release, that immediate release at metformin uh, approximately ninety percent of the drug is released within thirty minutes, whereas here, this is extensively slowly absorbed over 10 hours. And most important uh, thing is that, uh, you know, the, uh, the GI side effects are much less when we talk of an extended release. Next slide. So this is the slide that shows immediate release versus extended release. And you can see the GI side effects. Total GI side effects with <coughs> extended release is much higher at three, six months. Or, or uh, talking of vomiting, flatulence. And here uh, uh, as compared to extended release. Next slide. And always, it because of this is associated with increased adherence compared with your, um, uh, in, uh, you know, IR your immediate release. Next slide. Less side effects, more adherence, more compliant. The patient is when we talk of, uh, and with that, even your HbA one c improves from something like nine point four percent to eight point four when a patient has changed from an IR to metformin XR. Next slide. So this combination of sexagliptin and uh, metformin XR leaves combiglyce XR in it improves your glycemic control and over 24 hours is truly one daily fixed up combination. And this was just one study over four week multi-center multinational study where they used this combination. Uh, the patients were inadequately controlled for eight weeks with metformin alone. Um, uh, and uh, HP1 79%. And you could see that there, the combination there was a reduction in 24 hour glucose profile and and uh, your sugars came down as well. Next slide. So with this combination, uh, there was a significantly higher drop in HbA1c from baseline in saxagliptin in metformin XR preparation as compared to not only <laughs> not only giving metformin, but even up titrating plain metformin. So you have a plain metformin, you titrate from 1,000 to 1,500 to 2,000, you still found when this combination was given with the gliptin, the HbA1c uh, was much as was big, was reduced as compared to an up titrated one, and you could see that on 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 the on on this uh, on the slide with the black the black one is your saxagliptin metformin and the gray one is your metformin. So suffice to say, when you start this, if you talk your early intensification therapy, you start this combination where you uh, you achieve glucose control early uh, much HbA1c much faster even as you compare it to uh, even uh, rather than just starting on a baseline metformin and then up titrating up to a higher dose. So better to, so rather than a stepwise approach, better to hit it early and you would achieve a, a glycemic control much faster. Next slide. So that was about diabetes. So now we move on to dyslipidemia and we talked about the characteristic Indian phenotype and the, and what we have to offer dyslipidemia. So what is what do we know about dyslipidemia status in a diabetic patient in India? And what is the prevalence of, say, dyslipidemia? We talk about 79 and 9 percent patients on statin. Achieving LD, uh, uh, your uh, LDC or your uh, LDL control is, you know, you'd see less than 50 percent. And again, patients on statin plus other lipid lowering drugs and uh, achieving uh, your LDL goes still a, lo a lot of them don't achieve, but little better than just by by uh, just on a statin. So a lot of our patients still are not achieving goal and there's a high prevalence of dyslipidemia in their diabetics. Next slide. So when there is a need for appropriate treatment for diabetics, the risk of cardiovascular disease is higher for Indian patients. And I think the previous speakers must have told you in comparison with Europeans, it affects uh, uh, Indians almost a decade earlier. 10% of the heart attacks occur in Indians less than 10 years of age. 52% of the cardiovascular deaths occur under the age of 70 years. And in the inter-heart state, dyslipidemia appears to be the strongest co contributor of acute myocardial infarction in India, Indians. And we all have seen that in our, uh, on a daily practice as well. But note that they are, it, uh, they, it affects Indians almost a decade earlier as compared to the Europeans. Next slide. 
So if you, uh, you know, if you go through this slide, which is a little, this, um, um, it's got multiple uh, graphs of tables. What I could, all that it says that if you reduce your LDL uh, th um, by 39 milligrams per deciliter by statin, you reduce 21% risk of a major vascular event. So major vas major event, 24%, coronary vascular 24%, stroke 15%, well, at any vascular event. So what I'm saying is just fraction of 3940, you reduce almost 21% uh, risk of a major, major vascular event. Next slide. So having all this information, what do the guidelines suggest? So what is the common message in both the Europeans and American guidelines for managing dyslipidemia? Identify the LDL as a primary target. Lower LDL, uh, uh, lowering LDL is better with proven pharmacotherapy and better lifestyle. Both F <laughs> these em uh, em uh, guidance emphasize 50% or more lowering of LDL and also identify specific values to trigger further clinical action. And each set of guidelines uh, addresses the primary prevention uh, in addressing the primary prevention population estimation of a cardiovascular risk through some risk scoring systems. You have the European score and then you have the ACC or after arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease score. Next slide. So more than 50% reduction of your LDL. So a diabetic or a, a patient with or without dyslipidemia may have a moderate to high CV risk. And this is what the ESC guidelines suggest. So just being a diabetic puts you at a high CV risk. So yeah, people with any of the following, the classified is very high risk. That's diabetes with target, target organ damage or at least three major risk factors or early onset of type 1 diabetes of a, or longer duration of 20 years. So longer duration of diabetes, diabetes with target organ damage or at least three major risk factors puts you at a very, very high risk. <laughs> then what about high risk? They are here again, diabetes without target uh, organ damage and with diabetic duration of more than 10 years or one additional risk factor. So here I talked about earlier was very high risk or 20 years duration. Here 10 year duration, one risk, uh, with one major risk factors uh, and uh, without target organ, damage, target organ damage. Moderate risk is young patients, type one diabetic less than 35 years, type two, less than 50 years with diabetes duration of less than 10 years without other risk factors. So calcified, uh, you know, calculate score more than 1% and less than 5% for 10 year risk of fatal CVD. That's your moderate risk. And if you use a risk for, uh, and you find a calculated score of less than 1%, which uh, puts you at low risk of patients, but none of our diabetic diabetics are usually at a moderate or to a high risk. We have high cardiac CV risk. Next slide. So LD goals to be achieved based on the CV risk. <laughs> they are, we start off less than 16, low CV risk, hardly any for diabetic. Less than 100, that's why a lot of, a lot of our population, diabetic population are moderate CV risk. You have a young patient, less than 10 years, duration of diabetes, or type 1 less than 35 or type 2 less than 15, where you should achieve a target of less than 100. No. What about less than 70? They are high CV risk. And here you have a diabetic of more than 10 years without target organ uh, damage and with one additional risk factor as we initially uh, um, mentioned, and uh, less, and if you want to target an LV of uh, LD tar uh, uh, LDL target of less than 55, they are considered for a very, very high risk, uh, CV risk, and those are diabetic with target organ damage with more than three risk factors or more than 20 years of diabetes. So diabetics generally are now classified as, as moderate, high, or very high CV risk. And so thereby the targets are less than 100, less than 70, or less than even 55. Next slide. So AAS, and that was the ESC, ACC guidelines also recommend 50% LDL reduction for op, uh, optimal uh, ESC risk reduction. And that you see that uh, uh, in, uh, in the green one, that's with the mark slide that is that, you know, use the target by 50%, uh, the uh, initial statin to reduce your LDL to less, more than 50% if you want to reduce your risk of CBD. Next slide. So...
sorry i think i seem to have lost uh, apologize for that yes so if you need to uh, need to reduce more than 50% ldl reduction to reduce your uh, cv risk so if you uh, um, you when I mean, you reduce it by 50% you have a about almost 57% reduction in your event rate uh, next slide If, so LDL reduction by more than 50% reduces uh, uh, with lower number to treat. So you know if you achieve more, uh, a, a number to treat and achieve uh, reduction of LDL for 20% reduction, 63, and for 50% would be at 26. So what, what what I'm trying to say is that we need to reduce it by about 50%. Your LDL should be reduced to want to reduce your at a CD risk. Next slide. ESC 2019 guidelines, this is hypertriglyceridemia. We, we see a lot of our diabetic population. And here also they are suggesting that statins are the recommended as the first choice for managing hypertriglyceridemia where you have a triglyceride of more than 200. So statin therapy is recommended the first drug of choice for reducing CVD risk in high-risk individuals with hypertriglyceridemia, triglyceride more than 200. Next slide. Because we see a lot of our diabetic population who've got not only a high LDL, but we also have, we have a lot of uh, high triglyceride. And that's where, you know, it's, it's sometimes we in, in, uh, go on and prescribe a fibrin, but all guidelines suggest that say, that it for all patients for dyslipidemia, statins are recommended as the first line treatment. So intensification of statins to be considered before combination. Uh, when you talk of dyslipidemia in diabetes, statins are recommended. And if you talk of intensification also of statin therapy should be considered before the introduction of a combination therapy. So before considering adding a fibrate to a statin, it's better that you intensify your statin and start the statin therapy for patients with triglyceridemia. Next slide. So these are the European guidelines. What about the ADA guidelines and recommendations for statin and combination therapy in adults with a diabetes? And what we, what, what we are looking here as Less than 40 years, no atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk or risk of 120%. If uh, you, uh, you usually have to use a high, uh, in, in recommended is high intensity statin. And I think here in patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, if LDL is more than 70 milligrams, despite maximum tolerance statin dose, consider adding additional LDL lowering therapy such as ezetimibe. So here we're talking of give, uh, reducing it up to 70%. If you're talking of more, Someone whose age is more, uh, these are younger patients with less than 40 years, but they have a, a, a 10-year atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk of more than 20%. Then uh, you would consider reducing the target of, uh, as I mentioned previously, up to less than 70 and use a high-intensity statin. And if it's more than 40, year, uh, 40 years, again, uh, if <clears throat> if they, they already have an atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, then you, if it was less than 40 years, you wouldn't probably consider. But if they uh, if they didn't have, uh, you wouldn't consider, but here, even if they don't consider and they're both are 40 years of age, you might want to consider the moderate intensity statin therapy. And here again, in those with a high, high atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you want to bring down the LDL to less than 70. And if, if you cannot achieve it with the statin, you consider adding in an Next, uh, Next slide. And what are the high intensity uh, statin versus moderate intensity? High intensity means getting an LDL lower or uh, uh, more than 50%. And here you're talking about prosuvastatin 20 to 40 milligrams or atorvastatin 40 to 80 milligrams. And moderate intensity statin is where you're talking of reduction by about 30, 40%. Here you're using a prosuvastatin 5 to 10 milligrams versus uh, and an atorvastatin 10 to 20 milligrams uh, uh, and simvastatin 20 to 40. Low dose statin therapy is generally not recommended in patients with diabetes, but it's sometimes the only dose of statin that a patient can tolerate. So if a patient can't tolerate it, High intensity, then consider using a low intensity. Uh, and, on, and for patients who do not tolerate the intense, uh, intense intensity of statin, the maximum tolerated dose should be used. So, ADA guidelines for uh, other combination therapy statin plus fiber has not been shown to improve atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease outcomes and is generally not recommended. Statin plus niacin also has not been shown to pro provide additional cardiovascular benefits without statin therapy alone and may increase the risk of stroke with additional side effects and is generally not not recommended this as per the ADA guidelines of any cardiovascular benefits. So choosing the right statin. Next slide. So Rasuva statin was found to be the most effective in reducing the LDL uh, uh, and, and you're talking about the LDL HDL uh, ratio and also your non-HDL versus atova statin. And this was at, at 16 weeks of the urine study. Next slide. 
patients in this were not uh, over 18 years. They had type 2 diabetes and they had the elderly more than 127. And it did better than uh, atomostatin in, in, in reduction of ALDL, increasing your HDL and reducing your triglycerides. Next slide. And percentage of uh, patients achieving LDL uh, at uh, four weeks, as you can see, was higher with rosuvastatin than atorvastatin, uh, in less than 150, less than 100. And again, as I said, not of the, uh, these patients were diabetics. Next slide. So how can we ensure better efficacy outcome is choosing innovative research agent. Next slide. We have a lot of our <coughs> rosuvastatin in a market. And the expected efficacy range in a non-innovator agent as compared to innovator agents, you know, it can be anything between plus 25 to minus 25. You know, we have increased side effects and, and unsafe. And obviously, the other issue with your other, some of your other um, non-innovator agents or generics is, you know, you could talk of reduced e efficacy, drug efficacy as well. Next slide. So this was uh, another study which was comparing your, your uh, innovator versus the non-innovator. Uh, next slide. So that's what we talked about unsafe and non, uh, can be non efficacious or can be unsafe uh, when you talk of generics. So, when you talk of uh, generics versus innovator, and this is a, a study which uh, showed you cardiovascular uh, events and all cause death. And what was found that compared to brand statins, the probability of suffering a cardiovascular event for generics was higher, or almost to the average of 31% during a follow up. Uh, and all cause death also approximately was much higher, up to 36 percent. This was irrespective of previous occurrence of cardiovascular events. So again, maybe the innovator, obviously, <coughs> you, you, you know much about its efficacy. Next slide. So the other thing about is the stability of the innovator research uh, in the superstat molecule is much more, and because there are these impurities that can affect the lactone, the anti asthmore and these impurities can be formed during or after production of the rosuvastatin tablet and lactone, the anti isomer the phy keto acid, and these can impact the stability of the rosuvastatin formulation and most important, can also overall shelf life. Next slide. So we've seen, uh, it's been reported that a lot of being methylated impurities have been seen in various uh, generics uh, and that reduce your efficacy and these obviously a methylated atorvastatin impurity was highly uh, was highly conserved in uh, generic atorvastatin formulations, and, and what was found is thereby that the efficacy was much lesser to reduce your efficacy. Next slide. If you talk about diabetic dyslipidemia, earlier individualized treatment approach is recommended, as most of the guide current guidelines management diabetes mentioned, as well as a coexistent dyslipidemia tablets. We talked about early intensive control with a combination therapy of anti-diabetic drug and appropriate statin therapy will have better patient care, better glycemic control and dyslipidemia management. Metformin is the first line anti-diabetic drug since it's highly water soluble and half-life is just four to five years. And not only that, we are all aware of this drug. We've been using it for many years. And, um, you know, and if you off the drug, off the metformin, the sustained release is much, it's supposed to have a better, you know, uh, uh, compliance in terms of levels, just a GI side effects. If you have a dual matrix, I don't know, a metric system for metformin delivery will improve better drug delivery and improve patient adherence. And we have talked about this combination with DPP-4, saxagliptin uh, as a fixed dose combination, and this can have a better control, convenience, and reduce compliance. And this is truly once a day formulation in India, the saxagliptin metformin, the, the combi lice. Next slide. And when you talk of... Uh, when you talk of statin therapy, uh, the risk of uh, cardiovascular diseases in Indian patients is very high and it can be reduced by uh, reducing the LDL and guidelines all along uh, suggested the use of statin as the first line therapy. Even if you have a, someone with slightly high triglycerides, some of these neostatins are very potent in reducing triglycerides. And, in, and then it's better to intensify the statins to a maximum tolerated dose before using a combination therapy. So superstatin helps reduce LDL reduction by about 50, 52%. We talked about 50% reduction here, 52% triglyceride, but 21% in diabetic dyslipidemia patients. And to have uh, optimal efficacy, we can consider a uh, statin, uh, original, original statin. Uh, that's where I end. Uh, thank you for your attention. Sorry, in the middle, I had, uh, you know, there were some network issues. I'd be happy thank to you, take any questions. Oh, so one of the questions is, uh, saroglitazar, when do you use and when not to use? A very good question. That's one new uh, uh, new drug, uh, an innovator drug from Indian, in fact, an Indian research molecule. 
very, very usefully, strongly, uh, very helpful nowadays. I've seen a first line treatment in patients with NASH and uh, non alcoholic. I think all of our gastroenterologists and hepatology colleagues are, are, are using it. And also, someone who's got a very, very high triglyceride. And I think after, a com after using a statin, I think rather than combining with a fibrate, I would probably use it. It's, uh, it's very effective in reducing your triglyceride in someone who's got a predominantly high triglyceride and low HDL with a normal LDL. Those are those patients where you probably want to consider using a cerebral So, when do you use bromocriptin in diabetics and at what doses? Uh, I think I think we no longer use it. I think we no longer use bromocriptin. Now, there's, now we've got other drugs, better drugs. We now you know with the advent of the SGLT2 inhibitors, I think. Uh, <clears throat> It's uh, the bromocriptine generally is as the last, as the last, and those you know we don't. Uh, so it's not a very, very effi efficacious drug. We're worried about the orthostatic hypertension. It's not as efficacious as uh, as the other drug. But yes, certainly someone who cannot tolerate any of the other drugs and doesn't want insulin, very small dose, you might want to consider, but no longer use. Okay, so the next one is about SGL2 inhibitors. How do they help in diabetic dyslipidemia? Yes, yeah, so we are talking uh, uh, again, uh, the new drug on the 